Good morning. Happy New Year. Uh, I'm Lydia Santiago, I'm a South Psychologist and the Clinical Coordinator for KSAR, the South Adolescent Support Advocacy and Resource Center, and I'm a member of the Brown Rouse Committee. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Khadija Johnston, who is the Director of the Infant Town Program in the Division of Infant Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Khadija uh, has been uh, a practitioner in the field of infant and early childhood mental health since 1985, and she developed the Infant Town Program Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation Program in 1988, which now serves as a model for um, other organizations. Um, she is uh, nationally recognized and uh, provides training and consultation and presents nationally. And it's our pleasure, pleasure to have her here today to present her work. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be back after probably a decade um, since the last time I was at Brandon Brown. So let me tell you a little bit about the terrain that I hope will travel together over the next hour. Most of it is referenced in the title to my talk, and that is that I'm going to begin by describing research that uh, reveals artifacts, gives examples of racism as it is embedded and expresses itself in one institution, early care and education, although we know that all of the institutions and systems in our country are unfortunately influenced by our racial history. Specifically, I'm going to cite studies on the racial and gender disproportionalities in disciplinary practices among preschool-aged children in these studies. And then it's suggested by the opposite end of the title, I'm going to spend maybe not equal time, but a portion of the time describing a mental health intervention that appears to be an anecdote to the inequities, these racial disproportionalities um, in early time education. The modality that's proving to diminish racial disparities is infant and early childhood mental health consultation. Um, and the particular approach to this intervention that I'm going to talk about and which contains those characteristics shown to most consistently correlate with this kind of salutary effect on those disproportionalities was pioneered at and is practiced by myself and my colleagues, a few of whom, whom are in the room and I imagine back at ZSFG where we work. Um, over 30 years ago at the Infant Parent Program. I, I feel the need to add a uh, caveat, and that is, as a white person, I have some trepidation about speaking as if I'm an authority on racism. Um, conversely, I feel a responsibility uh, to use my unearned advantage for whatever positive possible impact can come of it. So that's why I've chosen this topic for today. So let's begin um, by talking about where does racial bias begin? Uh, I often think that we're aware as adults of how uh, our historical antecedents have expressed themselves in current race, gender, bias, and other forms of oppression. But it may be less familiar to think about just how early on those differences begin. So I'd like to talk a little bit about when babies begin to identify not only differences among physiognomy, but when they begin to show preferences or biases. Um, researchers at the University of Toronto and their colleagues from the UK, the US, France, and China showed that as early as six month old infants demonstrate racial bias in favor of members of their own race. In the first study published in Developmental Science in 2007, their results showed that as young as six months, those infants begin to associate, associate faces that look like them with happy music, and faces that don't look like them with sad verges. There's already an emotional valence. In the second study published by these same folks, um, the same group of researchers found that after about six months of age, infants were more likely to readily take cues from strangers 
characters whose physiognomy resembled theirs. Even when the information that was offered by those strangers was inaccurate. When the stranger would look to one corner of a visual representation and a picture of an animal would appear there, um, the infant would look there. But if they said physiognomy, they would also look in the inaccurate place. However, this wasn't true if the stranger was of a different race. What we're saying, in essence, is that infants appeared to selectively grant similarly looking, same race, adult models, the benefit of the doubt under conditions of uncertainty. Both studies, importantly, involved babies who had little to no prior experience with other race individuals. These findings then point to the possibility that racial bias later in life may arise from our lack of early exposure to other race individuals. And, and I think the next study of slightly older children, um, at least for those of us who work in the infant mental health field, 18 to 20 months is an older child, but um, it substantiates this hypothesis because toddlers who were raised in bilingual households are end up to be more equitable in their emotional resonance and in who they are willing to learn from. Um, and the greater the amount of experience, even at 18 to 20 months, that the toddler has had with racial diversity, the less bias they show. These astounding capacities of infants um, have been so these astounding capacities that infants have to distinguish differences and make meaning of how they are responded to really, I think, attests to the extraordinary weight of early relational experiences in how they shape the identity of and the worldview of children and eventually of all of us. At really the fundamental level of brain architecture, the relational experiences in the first three years of life account for almost 90% of the brain circuitry, which doesn't mean that we all can't make changes later in life. It's just more difficult. So for the majority of children in our country under five years of age, the primary people in addition to their parents who are really responsible for the trajectory of that brain topography are child care providers, are early educators. By one year of age, over half of the infants in the U.S. spend some portion of their day in the care of people in addition to their parents. And by three years of age, most children in this country are spending 35 or more hours in out-of-home care which means that the relational experiences with child care providers, and if we think about this in relation to how they learn about racial diversity or bias, is contributing mightily. It's not a neatly bracketed off bit between real life. It is real life. So that while um, there have been um, marked efforts and mark progress in the effort in recent decades to make sure that there is equity in access to early child care. There are still grave disparities that occur in child care based on race, on socioeconomic status, and on gender, with regard to both children's access to and experiences in early care and education settings. Um, so attending even what we would consider a high quality early education setting has been shown to have a, a plethora of positive benefits, especially for children from low income families. Yet children of color who are low income are less likely to gain access to quality early childhood settings. For instance, African American children are the least likely 
in this country to be enrolled in ECU programs that are rated as, considered as high quality. And um, they, the African American children, are rated lowest on their school readiness by the age of four. We've also seen that they receive harsher disciplinary practices in child care for the same identified behavior as their white peers. In a study now over a decade ago, um, my colleague and friend from Yale, Dr. Walter, Walter Gilliam, found that while African American children make up less than 20% of preschool enrollment, they comprise nearly 50% of those who are suspended one or more times. And subsequent studies by Dr. Gilliam found that the higher rates of suspension and expulsion were associated with higher reports of teacher stress and depression. So who the teachers are and what their experiences are contribute to their equanimity and to their perceptions of racial bias. Larger classroom sizes and less access to mental health consultants also contributed mightily to the rate of expulsion of children of color. So while the short-term effects of the expelling children, I don't know if any of you have heard of those studies. There was about, you know, one day um, on the Today Show that Dr. Gillian was interviewed 10 years ago about that study about expulsion rates. And I think most of us who don't spend our days in early parent education were astounded that the rates of expulsion of children under five years of age far exceeded the combined rate of suspension and expulsion for all older children. Um, while there was alarm properly at that point, what was not talked about when this study came out 10 years ago were the racial disproportionality in those expulsion rates. Now, I think we are paying more attention. But what we also have to recognize is while even the short-term effects of expulsion don't really have their intended impact, why do people expel young children from school? Um, Primarily, they think that it will lessen unwanted or unmanageable behaviors, or maybe just that it will really will give respect to teachers for a moment. Even those short-term effects are not proving to be true. But more importantly, perhaps, is that the longer-term impacts of suspension or expulsion are doubly are being shown to be doubly detrimental. Children lose access to needed referrals or other services and supports when they're not in school. And I would suggest that what is most important is, is that for a young child to repeatedly receive the message that you are unwanted, unmanageable, undeserving of care, and dangerous, accrues psychologically, and is internalized into, for very young children, their very core sense of self. Success in school and other aspects of life depends on having a sense of agency, the sense that you can have an effect on your world. And you develop from your relationships early on a sense of what the world has to offer. We can add, and I think should be saddened, but not surprised, that children then who are excluded from ECE programs, early care and education programs, don't typically do well academically later in life. They don't view themselves as learners, and they face, in fact, higher levels of incarceration. Actually, um, I don't think it's a coincidence that the exact percentage of proportionality of African American and Latino boys who are expelled at preschool matches and correlates to the percentage, the disproportional percentage in our in prisons. 
some of this data from these studies places the elevated risk for these outcomes at 10 times the likelihood of children who are not expelled in some childhood. So, what are the reasons? Why are young children of color, why are young children being expelled? Um, I'm sure that the, there are very many complex and probably interdependent reasons that they're multi-determined, but scholars and researchers have identified four primary characteristics low program quality, um, teachers' inadequate understanding of early childhood development, and especially of the sequelae, behavioral sequelae of early trauma. Um, and perhaps for this portion of our time together, most importantly, um, due to racial bias, which is what I'm going to focus exclusively on today. Why this emphasis for me, personally, because it's uh, compelling um, and I feel a commitment to contributing to trying to address structural racism and early care and education is one of the places that I and my colleagues at the Infant Parent Program can do that. I think on, on another level, increasingly the reason for the emphasis is because scholars and policymakers are hypothesizing that racism, racial bias, is the major contributor leading to these disciplinary disparities over all of the others. So that's why I'm choosing to highlight those today and focus on them. So I'd like to talk to you about a few studies, again, these were studies um, done by Walter Gilliam at Yale, uh, that showed the racial bias in early care and education. The first study, both of these studies were done with teachers at a very large uh, early education conference. And about 200 teachers in the first study were asked to watch a tape of children in a child care setting. And they were instructed to watch for where they saw challenging, disruptive, or aggressive behavior. Um, what's important to know is, is that there were no egregious or even minor acts of unruly or aggressive behavior. These were four child actors who were incredibly well behaved. One was an African American girl, one was a white girl, one was an African American boy, and one was an African American girl. What was the interesting point about this study was is that through deceptively using eye tracking, what Dr. Gilliam looked at was where teachers spent their time gazing. Where did they expect to see aggressive or challenging behavior? And all of the teachers, regardless of the teacher's race, spent the most time looking at black boys. African American teachers watch the black boys the most. One that says something about our preconceptions. We go looking for trouble. And if we go looking for trouble, we're likely to find it even when it's not there. We are likely to identify difficulty where we set our sights. When asked, 42 of the teachers said that the black boys needed the most attention, and 34% identified that the white boy needed the most attention. In the second study of Dr. Gilliams, with the same um, composite group of not the same teachers, but from the same conference, teachers were asked to read a description of a child's behavior and to rate the severity of the behavior. Um, to rate how hopeless or hopeful they felt about whether the behavior could be changed through their efforts in early childhood, and whether they would think about expelling or suspending this child for this kind of behavior. The only difference in the written description that the teachers received 
or it demands at the top. And this might sound familiar to many of you who know the studies about resumes of adults set to jobs, and that if the name sounds like an African American name as opposed to the name of a white person, the likelihood of receiving an interview is lessened by almost half. Similarly, the names Deshaun, Jake, Latoya, and Emily, the, the most fashionable names for the years that these child children in the study would have been born were used for their description. And in the description, um, it gave a description of some behaviors like uh, this child was unruly, they wouldn't nap, they ran away uh, at school time. In addition to the description of the child's behavior, some of the teachers were randomly given information about the family context, the home life. And in the description, the home life was turbulent. The father was absent. There had been um, domestic violence. The mother was working multiple jobs. There was housing instability. The outcome. Regardless of teacher race, white children's behavior was rated as more severe, suggesting an expectation bias. White children are expected to behave better. All of the teachers were more hopeless when they received the family background. This particular part of the study was especially, actually, discouraging initially to me. Um, as an infant mental health practitioner who believes that if we can increase empathy on teachers' part, and my thinking that if you know that a child has experienced difficulties or trauma, that that would immediately amplify empathy for that child. And in fact, this outcome suggests quite the opposite. So it was just initially especially discouraging to me, but then particularly evocative to think about. Because what it indicates is that information, facts, in and of themselves, do not encourage empathy. So what does it take? If we think that to understand one another and treat one another better, we need to amplify empathy. What does it take to promote an empathic response? Um, there's actually one other layer of complexity to the to this study, and that is is it what the teacher's rate and the perceived rate of the fictitious child were matched. Then, when they were given the family background, it did encourage a different response. The teacher felt more hopeful about whether she could have an effect on this child's behavior and less likely to expel the child. So this empathy effect is, as I said, consistent with other literature, uh, where we're most inclined to understand and help others who look like us. What I've asked us to think about and what we've thought a lot about in our intervention, our mental health consultation intervention, is how do we use this idea about encouraging empathy to inform our work? How do we amplify areas of similarity and discourage judgments about difference? Um, I'm going to go to the next. Um, slide where to talk about so how do we begin to address these inequities in racial disproportionality in disciplinary practices? Obviously, what we're doing right now, awareness of the problem, is an essential first step. Necessary, I would suggest, but not sufficient. Um, that solutions exist at the structural program and individual level. And at the structural level, many states, including our own, have begun in just the last four years when the awareness has been brought to this problem to enact legislation 
a well-known expulsion to severely limit the possibility of expulsion of very young children, always in concert with providing support, typically mental health support, for the teachers in those settings. Um, and in fact, um, while ITP, the infant care program's interventions are primarily at the individual child and family and program level, we feel dedicated to be involved in advocacy and policy change, and we were instrumental in getting some of the legislation passed in California related to expulsions and suspensions. Other states and local communities around the country are also beginning to address the issue by passing laws and policies. Um, what we find is that regardless of the target of our interventions, we adhere to the notion that effective interventions are always aimed at the adults in young children's lives. Um, and early childhood mental health consultation is one example of such intervention. So now I want to turn to, for our second portion, really looking at what do we know about early childhood mental health and consultations impact on these racial disproportionalities. And first, it would be good to begin by giving a brief definition and description of what mental health consultation in the early care and education settings in early childhood is. Um, and this definition will probably be familiar to many of you who are involved in consultation. Um, but early childhood mental health consultation is, of course, an indirect intervention in this case that cares a mental health professional from a variety of disciplines, um, social work, psychiatry, psychology, with other providers. And in this case, we're talking about providers in early care and education. But important to note that early childhood mental health consultation, both from the infant parent program and from other programs around the state and around the country, mental, early childhood mental health consultation is now being provided in every venue where prenatally through five young children and their families reside or cared for. So in the instance of the infant parent program, we provide ongoing, long-term mental health consultation, yes, primarily still to early care and education, but also to family resource centers, to home visiting public health nurses, to uh, within our own hospital, um, obstetric and pediatric providers, is to stop at domestic violence and homeless shelters anywhere and everywhere that young children and families are cared for or, or reside. And that within this collaborative partnership between a mental health provider and another provider, professional provider, um, what the work is is to promote and, when need be, improve the social, emotional, and relational health of the children, the families, and perhaps most surprisingly but importantly, the relational health and the social and emotional well-being of the providers themselves and the systems in which they work. But this model of consultation, although it does pay attention to individual families or children, is focused on the provider and what the provider brings to the interaction and how that might be detrimental or beneficial to encouraging development to growth for the child. The approach to infant and early childhood mental health consultation that I'm going to speak with you very briefly about today um, was developed, as I said initially, and has been refined and amended over the past now 30 years by my colleagues and me at the infant parent program. Um, it's really founded in and grounded on a conceptual quadrant. Our approach draws from infant mental health and psychodynamic and professional consultation theories and has more, more uh, recently embedded equity principles into our theoretical foundation. It's by braiding these conceptual cornerstones that infant and early childhood mental health consultation has become such a robust intervention. Um, and not that we think that mental health consultation can combat all of the problems.
those plaguing families, providers, or systems, or that we should view it as a panacea for these problems. However, when we think about mental health consultation as building a capacity, particularly the reflective capacity of providers in all disciplines, then it becomes an effort that is more far-reaching. The purview and the purpose of consultation is more expansive than earlier endeavors that focused only on an individual child or family. Initially, the focus of consultation effort has been, and often still is, on a particular syndrome within a family or child that were called in to consult around a case um, or a child who is struggling or thinking in the very environment intended to support optimal development, their homes or their child care centers. And while, of course, we need to tend to the maladies of an individual, it is still the central focus of mental health consultation to value and to show that there has been effect on the broader benefit uh, uh, to take a more upstream approach. What this means is, is that a mental health effort focused on the adult caregivers can ameliorate difficulties for individual children while fostering the healthy development of all of the children and families served in any of the spaces I mentioned. And not just the current families or children, but that if you are increasing capacity, especially reflective capacity of adults, then you are influencing how they see and treat and attend to future families and children. Um, as I said, this effort is also expanding to other systems, and this practice for the us at the Intensive Program is premised on what we call the consultative space. This is a term that was coined by my co-author Charles Brinneman and myself to really talk about the essential aspects of comportment. Regardless of which mental health discipline or in what setting we're consulting to, we believe that these ten elements um, of the consultative stance are core to the practice. Um, and core to the practice of any of us as mental health providers consulting in any venue. Um, the practice uh, is premised on the consultative stance, which asserts um, that how the consultant comports themselves in relation to the consultee is what has the biggest benefit for the children and families. We assert that effective mental health consultation is premised on the power or conversely the futility of the consultative relationship um, is what's most important and it resides in the consultant's way of being. We have been for the last 30 years of training both internally in our intensive training program and uh, in 22 states around the country and now internationally this approach to mental health consultation and in fact it's contributed to uh, the evidence base that is developing on the practice. So let me tell you about some of that evidence. Um, I, re I referenced this already, which is specific to expulsion, and that was Walter Gilliam's 2005 National Study of All State-Funded Preschool um, Programs. And it revealed not only the racial disproportionalities that I talked to you about earlier, but what it also revealed was that the, the children were most likely to be expelled from care when there was no mental access to mental health professionals. And conversely, programs that had mental health practitioners who were predictably present, not called in a crisis, but predictably present, were the lowest in expulsion across the country. In large measure, early childhood mental health consultation has actually risen to national prominence because of its impact of re on reducing preschool expulsion. And it was this same study that 
revealed the inequitable distribution of those policies. So what we know, and I think what we should be thinking about too, is just that before expulsion, we know that children, children of color, have often experienced multiple minor accruing racial uh, attacks, not intentional, that influence their very sense of self and how they can view themselves in the world which might, in turn, influence their behavior. Our colleagues, too, uh, um, in Arizona, have recently been collecting data in relation to early childhood mental health consultation on the impact of teacher perception. And, and for those in the room who are thinking, well, changing perception doesn't really matter, I would suggest quite the opposite. That if it's perception that causes one to think that a black boy is four years older than his age, which we have found in research, um, when viewed by an undergraduate student asked to rate his behavior or his level of threat. Um, we know that perception absolutely is what influences our response to each other, with perception based on bias in all directions. So that changing perception is a primary, a primary import in mental health endeavors, including consultation. Um, what happened in Arizona was that they had initially not looked at their impact in relation to race, and when there started to be the other studies that I told you about coming out, they de-aggregated their data and looked at when the focus of mental health consultation was a boy of color, either an African American or a Latino boy, what did they find? And initially they found that teachers rated on the DECA, the clinical DECA, when teachers rated African American and Latino boys the lowest in comparison to all the other children. And these were all children who teachers had asked for mental health consultation around because they were concerned about their behavior. So this is a group of children who were already the focus of mental health interventions because there were concerns or people were puzzled by their behavioral profile and development. But African American and Latino boys of that group of focused children rated lower than all of their peers on initiative, self-control, the capacity to have a close relationship, and the attachment that the teacher felt to them. And they have higher scores on inciting conflict, being an expulsion risk, and feeling that their effect was mostly negative. After just six months of consultation to those teachers around those children, those boys of color showed, I, I could say it a different way, the teacher's perception. We don't know that those children's behavior changed at all, but the perception changed radically in that those teachers then rated six months later those same children as having made the greatest gains in comparison to their peers, and importantly, as those gains in teachers' positive perception maintained for the next 12 months. And for, their, for any of us to be perceived as capable, willing, smart, committed, attached, influences how we feel about ourselves. But nowhere is the import of those relational views more important than very young children who take what they get and take it very seriously. It forms who they can see themselves to be and how they hold the idea of promise or peril in their relationships in the world. So what do we think is contributing from mental health consultation, why do these teachers' perceptions change? Is it information that the mental health consultant provides? Um, 
to get expertise about early development or behavior. And while those things are important, what recent studies are finding, the empirical evidence is that it really is the quality of the relationship that is developed between the mental health provider and their consultee that seems to be the mechanism of change, which we, I hope, will take you back to the idea of mental health consultant comportment that I spoke very briefly about. Very recent research cites the importance of the relationship between the consultant and the consultee as the central contributor to positive changes in not only the provider's perception, but in child care climate and in child outcomes. Focusing on the characteristics of mental health consultation that correlate with effectiveness in this study, Green and her colleagues found that it was the quality as rated by the providers, the quality, the equity of the relationship between the consultant and the consultee. When the consultee said, I feel as if my consultant treats me as a partner, is equitable, understands my subjective experience of children, then there was the, that was the most salient predictor of effective consultation outcomes. Increased frequency of the consultant's involvement and the time over time bolstered that perception of the relationship. It seems that this consultant consultee relationship, the quality of it, has particular import in reducing implicit bias. Um, in another very recent study by Annie Davis at Georgetown, that what she found was that if she assessed what, uh, whether variables related to race and culture affected the consultative relationship and the outcomes and what the link was between the two. And what she found was that the quality of the consultant consultee relationship, what she terms as the consultative alliance, had a more significant impact when the child, when the focus of the consultation was a child of color. And this more greatly impacted how attached the teacher felt to that child. More importantly, perhaps also, the teacher's willingness or hopefulness about whether she could have an impact on the child's outcome. And an impact and efficacy in adults might seem like something that we wouldn't be paying a lot of attention to, but when we first started um, mental health consultation at the Infant Parent Program, we uh, used a measure about teacher efficacy, which is still used in, in many of these studies. And what we found was that as, at, before consultation, when you ask teachers um, questions as gross, and I don't mean as appealing, I mean as broad. If you ask teachers questions like, do you think that anything you do in the course of an eight-hour day with this child matters to who they become or how they behave? Most teachers in our sample and across the country now in samples have said no. It doesn't matter what I do. What matters is what happens at home. Despite the fact that what I told you at the very beginning of this presentation is that most children, three years of age in this country, are spending 35 to 40 hours a week with these people who do have an effect. But if you don't feel that you have an effect on a child's behavior, what motivation would you have to enhance, change, be interested in what you do. So the impact of mental health consultation on a teacher's feeling of efficacy is one of the primary uh, reasons for our intervention. So these teachers felt more efficacious, more attached, and more confident in their ability to work with these children. Um, it's also important to note that when the consultant said that they have an expertise, which is kind of a 
interesting word to use in relation to equity and diversity, but that was the way the question was asked. When consultants identified an expertise or had done studies, self-reflection, um, intentionally was thinking about and working around the basis of equity and diversity, those consultants have a, a more uh, salutary impact on conscious, uh, on the outcome as well. And the teacher and mental health consultants racial matching also positively impacted outcomes. So why do we think that this is the case? And um, I've hypothesized uh, several factors. Um, I think that mental health, why is mental health consultations impact so strong on racial disproportionalities? One is I think an approach that is dynamically informed has at its core the idea of bringing the unconscious to conscious awareness. And most of the bias, the racial bias that we're talking about in these situations is implicit bias, not conscious. So before we can change our biases and behaviors, we have to bring them to consciousness. As I told you, the, the, the width and the direction of mental health consultation is to promote the capacity to reflect, to the ability to reflect on the, our own biases, to increase empathy, um, to, as mental health professionals, lean into and tolerate discomfort rather than supporting defenses against it. We also work to broaden the behavioral meaning so that when uh, behavior of a child is described as aggressive or violent, we are trying to broaden the behavioral meaning for providers and to explicitly address the impact of historical and contemporary trauma for both the staff and the children around whom we consult. And lastly, um, to use uh, not only the words of Brian Stevenson, um, but um, Brian Stevenson, I don't know if folks are aware of him, probably more aware of him since the uh, movie came out, maybe uh, Just Hope came out last week, but perhaps people are aware of him as a, a public interest lawyer um, and founder of the Racial Equity uh, Institute in Alabama, an organization that strives to eliminate discrimination. And what Sam Stevenson talks about is that there are four characteristics of all endeavors that he believes address injustice and particularly racial equity. Um, those being, first, to get proximal to the situation, which those of us in the infant mental health world and in consultation try to get proximal all the time to placing ourselves purposely in family homes and in the places where families reside and are cared for. And in addition to getting proximal, uh, the idea of being able, Brian Stevenson said, to tolerate and in fact embrace the discomfort of conversations around racial bias. Um, and the third of his four factors is that there's a narrative that we live by, the water we swim in in this country, a narrative about race, and that it's incumbent to change the narrative. So we're attempting in our own small way to change the narrative about what, and what are the antecedents to and meaning to children's behavior, and in this case, particularly for children and boys of color. And the last that Brian Stevenson and I, and I hope all of us, all abide is that we have to hold hope even in a face of brutal, unbearable facts. So I hope that in Indy, um, you will hold hope with me. Thank you. And we have just a few minutes, there's a little glare on the clock, but I think we have about seven or eight minutes for comments, thoughts, questions. Yes. Thank you.
there is a corollary diagnostic manual for children birth through five that is a DC zero to five. Um, we are also all working assiduously to try and crosswalk and have medical and other forms of reimbursement uh, appreciate their crosswalk between. But the diagnostic manual that has been used to the extent that any has been used in, in, in looking at the children that were expelled were DC 0 to 5 diagnoses. But there has been no um, rigorous look at those children who were expelled. Um, the the data that I the Arizona data that I briefly spoke about um, those the, 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 the clinical data goes along with a diagnosis and so there that was looked at in terms of the diagnosis of those children and that was I gave you the the description of the racial um, closing the racial disparity gap. But when they looked at all of the children that were focuses of mental health consultation, um, there were shifts in the diagnosis of those children. But it's also important to know it's a pretty small and, and not all of the children were diagnosable. One of the intended intentions of mental health consultation is that it's a promotion, prevention, as well as intervention effort. So um, I wouldn't say we could speak resoundingly about that. And I think the answer to the last question is no, but let me, let me remind you of what it is. So I guess I want to switch it. The answer is an unequivocal, sorry, I, I mixed up the two questions. It's an unequivocal yes. It was the, it was, and in the studies that have happened so far in this and in the United States, the most significant mediator. It, along with, and I didn't speak at all about this, and I know we need to end in one minute, but the other was, um, was, the relationship between the child's family, the parents, and the teacher or school. Um, I uh, like to say, and I probably um, borrowed it or stole it from my colleague Walter Gilliam, is that um, expulsion is an adult decision, not a child problem. And what we found was when, or what was found is that when teachers and parents had a well-established relationship and mutual understanding. Um, so likelihood of what expulsion happened was very, very low. Um, and that was another mediating factor. Um, and mental health consultation works at the adult relationship, both inter-staff relationships, director-staff relationships, but a particular focus on parent-staff relationship, particularly when um, the relationship between the parent and the provider around a child who is struggling um, is the focus of the consultation. So, thank you for those really provocative questions. I appreciate it. And I didn't see and don't know if there were other questions or thoughts. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you.